I know that my parents struggled with the why of their survival every single day. Why did they survive? Why my mother would say she and not her brother, brother Arik and Monik. My mother would ask, my father would ask why he and not his brother Shlema and Moshe and Chaim, why they? And as I grew older, I started asking very personal questions of why, why did I survive? To which there really are no answers. But then one broadened out to ask some other questions of why. Why? Why did it happen to us, the Jewish people? Why was the world silent? Why didn't the Almighty intervene? Why? Why didn't they bomb Auschwitz? Why wasn't the St. Louis permitted to dock? And some are very universal questions to which to this day we don't have answers, so we may never have answers. And certainly to the personal questions, we don't have answers. But in search, in search to some answers, I learned a few facts. Fact number one, the world knew then what was happening to the Jewish people. No, we didn't have CNN, and we didn't have C-SPAN, and we didn't have all the instant means of communications, but the world knew. Who knew? Those people in positions of power and influence and decision knew. They didn't have to wait for a Herschel Greenspan to commit suicide in a hotel room in Paris so that the world would find out because they would ask, why did he kill himself? And the answer was, so that the world would know that the Jews were being slaughtered. They didn't need a Yankarski to knock on the doors of world capitals to say Jews are being killed because as early as the summer of 1941, the leaders in Washington and in London and in Paris knew that on July 21, in 1941, so many and so many Jews were killed in Bialystok, in Lachovic, in Mursh, they knew. And to know that they knew is a very haunting fact. But at the same time, something else became very evident. That wherever and whenever and however good people stood up to say no, Jews lived, Catholics lived, gays lived, gypsies lived. And what we now know is that in places throughout the world, when people stood up to say no, People lived. And so, and so I've changed from asking the questions of why to asking the questions of what if. What if? Instead of one Raoul Wallenberg, one Oscar Schindler, there were 100,000 Raoul Wallenbergs. If one Raoul Wallenberg saved 100,000 Jews, can you imagine 100,000 Raoul Wallenbergs? You wouldn't need Holocaust museums. You wouldn't need commemorations. And do you know? Bulgaria saved its Jewish community. Albania saved its Jewish community. How ironic, we make fun of the Balkans. And it wasn't in the birthplace, in the center of civilization, of art and music and philosophy. It wasn't out of there that magnificent chapters of human decency and respect and courage were written. They were written in Bulgaria and in Albania, where this country said no. 
and 50,000 Jews in Bulgaria survived and 20,000 Jews in Albania survived because from the king to the patriarchs to the peasants to the politicians, they all said no. And what if? What if we exchanged trucks for Jews in Romania? What if we bombed Auschwitz? Read those documents when you go to the Holocaust Museum. And you nobody would cry or scream. We didn't want to divert our war effort to destroy the killing machines. 10,000 Jews were being put up the gas chamber every day. And why didn't we permit the refugees of the St. Louis and the Evan LeBenz conference when the world already knew and they came together, all the democracies fighting Nazism came together to see whether they can find refuge for the remaining Jews that were still alive? You know who offered 140,000 visas? The Dominican Republic. Nobody else. Nobody else. Our neighbor to the north, Canada, had no room for 5,000 Jewish orphans. Switzerland had no room for Jewish orphans. And so what I have, I guess, been fortunate in my adult life is to first ask the question, what if? What if there were 100,000 Raoul Wallenbergs? What if? What if more people had the courage to stand up and to say no? If Bronislava Kropi, my nanny in Baranovich, Poland, now Belarus, who could barely read and write, didn't have the courage to say no, you'd have somebody else standing here today at this podium. And so, the lessons, the lessons that we carry forward is what you heard the two students this morning attest to. The ability to stand up, to say no to bigotry, to say no to prejudice, to say no to racism, to say no to anti semitism And you know what? We know it works. We know it works. But you know what? It's a lot more difficult than you think it is. Ask the question, ask that haunting question. If you were there, if you were there, would you have the courage to stand up and say no? And when we, and in the ADL, we have many programs, Stop the Hate, Fight the Hate. We do it in schools. We bring them to the Holocaust museums, etc. And at the end of the day, the question is, so what do you want us to do? And my answer is, sounds very simple. I want you to have the courage to stand up and say no. When you hear a joke about somebody else, when you hear an epithet, just stand up and say no. Oh, that's simple. No, it's not. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. And yet, that's what can make a difference. OK, anti-Semitism today. My first book was called Never Again, Question Mark. I never thought I'd have to write that book after Auschwitz. When the world saw, when Auschwitz was revealed and everybody saw the handiworks of hatred, did we ever think that we would face an explosion of anti-Semitism as we saw in Europe in the year 2000? No, but it was there. Well, here we are in 2008 and 2009, and six months ago, it began. It began. It started with the economic crisis. And as the economy began to tumble, 